The Jews in the desert begin building the Mishkan, the tabernacle, in this week's Torah portion. And Moses, Moshe, announces that God has appointed a young man named Betzalel to be the master craftsman in charge of building the Mishkan. The Torah tells us that Betzalel was an expert in fashioning gold and silver and copper and in carving stone and in woodworking and in weaving clothing. Now we know that's not possible. He was a young man who had just been freed from slavery. He wasn't an apprentice to da Vinci during the Renaissance. Even if he was born with wondrous talents, there's no way that he would have had enough life experience to become a master in so many different art forms. Obviously, God, in addition to bestowing talent upon him, had gifted him the expertise necessary to be a master craftsman in all those different areas. Why, then, was he chosen for such incredible gifts? The commentators tell us that if you look carefully at the passages, you can begin to tease out an answer. But Salo's lineage is traced back not just to his father, but also to his grandfather, Hur. In contrast, Betzalel's assistant, Aholiav's lineage, is only traced back to his father. Why? Because Betzalel's grandfather, Hur, is the key to this puzzle. Hur was one of the two people, along with Aharon, Aaron, the high priest, Moshe's brother, that Moshe left in charge of the Jewish people when he went up on the mountain the first time to get the tablets. When he came back down the mountain in the immediate aftermath of the sin of the golden calf, only Aharon was still there. Because unfortunately, the sinners among the people had killed Hur when he tried to prevent them from building the golden calf. And so by appointing Hur's grandson, Betzalel, in one fell swoop, God accomplishes multiple goals. First, up in heaven, he's allowing Hur, who gave up his life to sanctify God's name, to beam with pride as his grandson assumes a position of such importance and prominence. Second, what poetic justice. The Mishkan is meant to effectuate full atonement for the sin of the golden calf. Who better to be the master craftsman to build it than the grandson of the person who died giving up his life to try to prevent that sin? And third and most important, God was concerned because the Jewish people were worried. Is God really going to give us full forgiveness? And so God's telling them, yes, sleep easy at night. Rest assured, I am going to fully forgive you. And I'll show you a sign so that you'll know that. I'm appointing as the architect of atonement, the grandson of Hor, the guy you killed. I would never do that if I wasn't going to fully forgive you. That would be a cruel joke. And so God's reassuring them. Now think about that. It would be more than enough, Dayenu, for God to merely forgive them. But he goes the extra mile. He not only forgives them, but he wants to give them reassurances so they won't be worried. And we mimic that behavior. You'd think that if someone were to wrong me or sin against me in some way or hurt me during the day, I'd go to sleep at night and when my head hit the pillow, I'd stay awake a few minutes conjuring up all sorts of inventive ways to serve up some revenge on a cold platter. But instead, what do we do? We say the bedtime Shema. And the first prayer among that set of prayers is one in which we declare to God, I hereby forgive any person who sinned against me, who wronged me, who antagonized me, whether against my body or my possessions or my honor, whether it was done accidentally or even if it was done on purpose. God, I'm declaring to you, I forgive that person. Please don't punish anyone on my account. And we're not meant to merely say those words. We're supposed to mean them. We're supposed to show God, God, you went the extra mile to forgive and to reassure. We're going to go the extra mile too. Thank you.